Welcome to the RSP Cast. I'm Matt Waldman with the Rookie Scouting Portfolio. Today's episode is a solo cast on the 2024 quarterback class. It's a good group of prospects worthy of your attention as an NFL fan, a Dynasty League GM, and in a few cases as a fantasy GM in redraft and best ball formats. I'm going to discuss the one to two prevailing thoughts I have about the 20 quarterbacks that are going to be featured in the 2024 Rookie Scouting Portfolio pre-draft publication. It's available for pre-order right now at mattwaldman.com, M-A-T-T-W-A-L-D-M-A-N.com for April 1 download. So if you haven't purchased the RSP in the past, just know it's a PDF draft guide. It covers at least 150 players at the offensive skill positions of quarterback, running back, wide receiver, and tight end. And it's been available for download every April 1st since 2006. And for over a decade, I've also delivered a post-draft guide that's available one week after the NFL draft. And that's part of the subscription price for the RSP of $21.95. The RSP is how I make my living. So if you enjoy this podcast, you like the YouTube channel, you like what I do on Twitter or TikTok, all that work is simply me sharing really a small amount of the background research that I do every day to get ready for this publication. I go deep with the rookie scouting portfolio and it helps you go deep with your knowledge so you can go deep on your league mates. Now look, I've been in sales for a long time and what I'm sharing is actually pretty low on frills and huge on substance. New readers who, who get the RSP are almost always pleasantly shocked with what they get. Now, I'll share more detail about the RSP later in the podcast. This show, you know, you call it A through Z on quarterbacks. It's really A through T if we're going to be technical. It's going to be like last year's solo casts on the other positions. I'm going to be sharing one, two things about these quarterbacks that I found notable, and I'm going to be doing it in alphabetical order. These thoughts fall into categories of, let's see, praise, criticism, lingering questions, or even broader thoughts about the quarterback position. These are far from complete scouting reports. If you want the full deal, 2195, mattwaldman.com, and that's going to get you that full deal. And if you're like most who give me feedback about the price, you're going to feel like you're underpaying. Yeah, I'm selling you, but it's the truth. And, you know, generally I get people who say, I heard a lot of buzz, but it's better than the buzz. So this quarterback class, it has a lot of buzz. And I think it's good. At the same time, I don't think the top of this class overall is as strong as last year. Um, And when I say the top, I'm not talking about a singular player. I'm talking about the players considered for the first round. At the same time, I think this class has more depth in terms of the number of players at the top or near the top who have the talent to develop into contributors or starters. So if you're a fantasy GM, we know that Caleb Williams is the answer, is a priority pick. No surprise there, right? Now, what may be a surprise to some of you is I don't think there's really another priority pick at this position this year. If you're, you're going to take Caleb Williams, he's the top priority pick. I don't think there's a 1-2 answer or a 1-2-3 answer in the way that most of us thought it would be, you know, Richardson, Stroud, and Young. And I still think there's a chance for that to still work out with those three. But um, really, I don't think there is a top three on this board that's just clear cut. And when you consider the almost coin flip of a hit rate for most first-round prospects, uh, and that really there's, you know, at least from the NFL buzz we're seeing during the combine, post-combine, that maybe four to six of these options could be first-round picks. I would expect maybe two to three of the top six quarterbacks that I think most people have as their top six. Two to three of them may hit. And I think that's a realistic expectation. Um, but I don't think... Of the player, the five players after Caleb Williams, that there's anybody that I look at and go, yeah, you got to get this guy. If anything, I would say you probably want to, 
invest in rookie receivers this year in the early rounds, maybe a running back or two, and then build on a surplus of talent at those positions so that you can then trade away that surplus for a quarterback who's established. And I think that's the case this year in standard formats. Now, if you want to take a quarterback, I would recommend waiting for the one out of that six or the two out of that six who fall to the middle of the second round. And there's probably that's probably going to happen because I don't think we're going to see six quarterbacks go in the first round, maybe three to four. And there'll be a, a couple that go in the second round, maybe one or two that go in the third round. And that means that they're going to see their draft stock fall in fantasy formats. Now, if you're in super flex formats, and obviously a lot of you are, there are three to four worth considering in the second half of the first round or early half of the second round. But, you know, a lot of a lot of people are going to be picking these guys with the first five to six picks. And I just don't know if you want to go that route. Now, if you're tearing down your team to the studs and rebuilding in a startup or your team is in that no man's land of being good for a top three pick, but not good enough to be a playoff contender, then stockpiling quarterback talent could be a viable strategy either by getting two of my top three options at the position in the opening two rounds or getting one and taking another strong option next year if all else fails. Still, I'd recommend you consider spending that capital on wide receiver this year. So before we get to this quarterback class, it should be stated pretty much annually that when considering the physical, technical, conceptual, intuitive and emotional facets of the position quarterbacks the most demanding role on the playing field I, um, in sport evaluating the positions difficult and I've had my share of misses and I'm going to continue to have my share of misses Dak Prescott and Justin Herbert stand out thus far as the most recent misses in the past 18 years of players that I didn't think would be as good as they are and I would say that I've had a pretty strong track record of avoiding players where I've said they're not good and they've turned out to be good in terms of like, if you're going to look at it that simplistically. Um, I've been known for taking stands that were ahead of the curve with the likes of players like Russell Wilson, Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, and even less regarded prospects like Brock Purdy while raising significant doubts about high-end prospects with a lot of buzz like Baker Mayfield, Drew Locke, Mitchell Trubisky, and Zach Wilson. Now, I'm sharing these hits and misses not to brag, but just to set up some points about quarterback evaluation that are important for scouting every class, and especially some of the cl players in this class near the top. And I did this last year. I just kept it for this year because some of this stuff's evergreen, and it's a good reminder for you. Box score stats aren't always contextually sound data. Confidence is an attractable trait with quarterbacking. And another one is that age analysis is a nice idea, but I think the application is troublesome at this stage. So let's begin with point number one. Box score stats aren't always contextually sound data. I originally brought this up with Baker Mayfield during his senior bowl, and I got some pushback from the media analytics community years ago about that. They loved Mayfield for his completion percentage I noted that accuracy is a deceptive category because completion percentage doesn't show how precise the pass placement is relative to the route break or the position of coverage. Completion percentage doesn't show whether the receiver is responsible for a bad outcome because a good decision and execution um, from the quarterback didn't work out due to the receiver or whether that completion percentage is a reflective of whether the quarterback executed the decision with the appropriate speed of confidence. Let's talk about that more a little bit later here. You know, speed of confidence is a really essential thing. Mayfield had a high completion percentage, but his placement often failed to be pinpoint by pro standards, which he got away with at Oklahoma because of the way most coverage, most college defenses had to play the OU offense. And Mayfield was often late with delivering targets that should have been completed if he processed the game with the decisive confidence we see from NFL starters. Now, Mayfield is starting to turn a corner, and if he can continue to do so, then look, he's going to be a nice NFL starter. I'm happy for him, but it wasn't 
you can see that his process or of development really wasn't commensurate with as high of the pick that he was. And that was really my overall point about him is that he needed some time and he needed more development than the buzz it was giving. And part of that came down to what I do with the RSP is it's a charting methodology. You know, what I love about charting quarterbacks is that it contextualizes the degree of accuracy that completion percentage doesn't come close to doing. For every game I chart, I'm categorizing every throw based on situation, arm platform, target distance, target zone, accuracy type, and appropriate velocity for the throw. This is going to include scripted and unscripted situations, throwing on and off platform, throwing from a stance and on the move, passes delivered to the same side of the field in the opposite hash, as well as the presence and absence of pressure and targets against man and zone coverage. The combinations of these criteria are matched with the zones and distances, um, the distances uh, of the field where the target's being uh, attempted. You know, and I'm calling distances really from the quarterback, from their throw point to the receiver, not the line of scrimmage. So those distances include short range targets from the pitch point to at least 14, uh, no more than 14 yards downfield. Intermediate ranges for me are no, you know, are from basically 15 to 28 yards, vertical from 29 to 48 yards, and deep ranges of distances greater than 48 yards. And the zones for me are basically the sideline, flat, and middle of the field in the short, intermediate, vertical, and deep ranges. And the percentage thresho thresholds I use for grading accuracy in the RSP come from next-gen stats for most of the criteria that I just mentioned. So what you can, what basically is happening here is that I'm seeking pinpoint accuracy that reaches a receiver exactly where the target should arrive based on the route, based on the receiver's position on the field, his primary, the position of his primary coverage, and the secondary coverage of the defense. I take these things into account and, you know, and look for pinpoint accuracy as well as a reasonable percentage of general accuracy. And general accuracy is just simply placing the ball in an area where a receiver has a reasonable chance to catch the ball. A quarterback doesn't have to display pinpoint accuracy in the RSP for every attempt at his top range to earn a spot in a, in a certain accuracy tier. But at the same time, there should be enough throws that illustrate that the effort is rec replicable as he devotes extra time to his game. So while I'm using specific percentage thresholds as explained in these accuracy grades, all charting data has a small sample size, regardless of what anyone tries to tell you in the public space. It's all really more important to contextualize the data as much as possible. And it means that the use of this charting data to create thresholds is a work in progress. And when I see fit to use additional context to grade a player to a higher or lower tier of the data, I do that to some extent. Um, it's not a, something I do regularly, but it may happen on occasion. So when comparing the use of these thresholds and the way I've evaluated accuracy in the past, the differences aren't really massive. However, I've found that the data is particularly or really useful for clarifying which tier where I place specific performances. And in the case of a player like, say, Dak Prescott, who had multiple accuracy grades on the cusp of higher tiers, I, it probably would have made a discernible difference for how I graded him. Um, and it's definitely more valuable than box score accuracy. Mayfield, Lamar Jackson, they were, you know, they were overvalued. Let's see, how would I put this? Mayfield was overvalued and Lamar Jackson was undervalued based on box score accuracy. In contrast to my lower grade for Mayfield, I was higher on Jackson because he was more accurate than his box score data would have led you to believe because of the number of drop passes from his receiving core. And when you're charting, you know, you're charting a player, you're charting accuracy. You're not charting completion percentage. You are charting passes that should have been caught, that were placed where they were supposed to be, regardless of what the receiver did. That's why one of the reasons I really like that. So when people were questioning, questioning Lamar Jackson's viability as a quarterback, they 
if they could have seen his charting on a regular basis, they wouldn't have even remotely questioned his positional viability. That was just ridiculous. And now that we've seen him win two MVPs, I think I think we've confirmed that without a shadow of a doubt. This analysis has also given me the confidence to stand firm with insights that went against the grain, but have proven out over time. And you can include Drew Locke and Zach Wilson as recent examples rooted in this charting methodology, as well as Desmond Ritter, most likely, um, from what I've seen thus far. So we may see another Baker Mayfield, Lamar Jackson dynamic with two projected first round prospects in this class. Michael Penix Jr., who I think is seen as a bit of a system quarterback with a great arm, but maybe not the field reading skills. And Drake May, who's seen as a first round lock with pro ready skills, who's one, two with Caleb Williams. Now, based on my charting and how I've defined my quarterbacking criteria, I think Big Draft has had these players wrong for a while. May has pro ready skills, but I think he also has development limiting gaps that could be best sorted out away from the field, kind of like the Jordan Love plan that the Packers applied. That was awesome for what the Packers did because I remember when Jordan Love got picked in the first round and I thought, no way is this dude remotely ready. He's got the physical skills, all the physical skills you want, but his game is just not tight enough for him to come in and play right away without really struggling and impacting his confidence and his game deteriorating. Now, I think May could be a little bit in that boat. Maybe not as much as Love, but it's closer to him being in that boat than he is to being in Caleb May, um, Caleb Williams' boat right now. I don't. I think there's a big difference between these two guys. Now, Penix, I think he would benefit from some time to acclimate. In fact, everyone at, including Williams, really the first six quarterbacks, I think all would benefit from time away from the field. I think Caleb Williams is the one that's safe enough to safe enough to put on the field, and you and he would survive it and begin to thrive over time. Penix, I think, would benefit from a certain amount of time to acclimate because. I, but I also think that his accuracy and execution at the position is good enough that he could develop as a first-year starter if in a good enough infrastructure and a friendly scheme. I'm concerned that while May's talented, he could struggle regardless of the circumstances if used immediately. There was a point in some earlier podcasts that I said I didn't have a draftable grade on May, but qualified that by saying, but I haven't seen everything that I need to see yet. And after some deep digging, I think he's a viable NFL prospect as a future starter. But I think he's on the low end of that scale that I just mentioned. And there's a real strong possibility that he might not ever get there. We're going to talk about that a little bit in a minute. Penix and Bo Nix, they're going to get downgraded in a lot of media analysis because they're older. Okay. Now, For me, age is a little bit like that ill-advised wide receiver model from a decade ago where some analytics consultant for the Eagles decided it was a bright idea to filter out all prospects who weren't at least 6'2 and 2'10 at the wide receiver position. Now, while there's value to creating these filters after you've evaluated every player for their skills and determined who's really the best on your board, then you can look at it and say, should we filter that out? Or do these players play to that level of the 6'2", 210-pound mark that we find desirable? Rather than saying, forget players who are like Isaac Bruce, Steve Smith, Antonio Brown, you know, any, you know, Stefan Diggs. Forget all those guys. Just Let's just look at other ones, you know, and that may not even be remotely as good. Congratulations, you've just basically fucked up your draft board. You know? So while I think there's value to creating these filters, um, the, the thing is, is that there's a theory to me with age that really after you've evaluated a player for their skills, you know, we don't want 
we don't really want to huh, let me start over here with this well I think there's value to maybe these filters that I just mentioned after you've evaluated every player for their skills they're good but I think the models are really susceptible to ham-handed applications and I think age can be one of those things because the idea of the theory of say an older player should be better right now because he has more experience with identifying and executing on the field than younger players that theory I buy that's a good theory the game slows down for older players when they earn that playing experience now the practice of how to use that theory and apply it to scouting players man that's more ham-handed than football personnel evaluators at an all-you-can-eat pig fest at Saucy Q down the street from the Senior Bowl. I mean, to begin with, how one creates a scoring system to evaluate age as a variable without generating a high degree of variation from how it's applied from one player to the next, that's rife with problems from the get-go. And, and see, the real root issue is what's embedded in this valid idea that the game slows down for players as they age and earn playing experience. The idea that he'll get better with experience is the same rationalization we hear annually about first-round quarterbacks who wash out of the league. The idea has merit, okay, but without identifying at least the following things about prospect, the idea of age is useless because you got to identify which skills actually get better with experience. And are, do they get better with both positive and negative experiences on the field? Or do they only get better with positive experiences? Or, in rare cases, do they only get better with negative experiences? Which skills need more positive experiences than negative ones for a player to develop? Which skills don't usually improve if the player hasn't already mastered them before entering the pros. See, so when you look at it from that perspective, to me, age is a sloppy coat of white paint without examining the surface where it's supposed to go. It's like saying, maybe in another sense, if you eat better, you'll reduce your chances of contracting cancer. Now that's great, but with millions of dollars at stake, do you want your football organization to increase their chances of the equivalent of that without a nutritionist, without some studies? You know, it's kind of like saying, you know, we'll increase our chances. Whatever we do here is going to increase our chances of landing on the moon with all these, all this money at, at stake. But we'll just hope it happens rather than wanting precise calculations, you know, with some reasonable degree of error, understanding what that error is and how much of an error we can tolerate. Now, Drake May and J.J. McCarthy, their field reading isn't just going to get better with experience. It may look that way. It may be easy to say it that way if you're, you know, a talking head at ESPN with no football experience, you know. But it doesn't mean that Penix or Bo Nix's experience isn't necessarily why they have more consistent skills with reading the field. This is why raw and inexperienced or raw and experienced are vague terms that can mean too many things that lead you down the wrong path. You know, they may be synonymous, but synonymous things aren't exactly the same. It can be similar and important differences. You know, raw and inexperienced in the same way that say like the Queen Gambit um, character Beth Harmon was inexperienced playing tournaments. That's a type of rawness that has a shit ton of advanced skills but just lacking performance experience on a big stage. Now, if you're looking at defining raw as technically and conceptually unskilled, we could look at Malik Willis as a good example, you know, as a recent player, and you're talking about something very different. So we're going to begin with our quarterbacks here, but we're going to start with B and then circle back to A in a moment. B is going to be Bo Nix because he's old for a prospect and a good example for what I just talked about with age. People are knocking him for his experience. Now, I've seen quarterbacks much older with more experience than Bo Nix in the NFL who've never possessed the self-awareness that Bo Nix displays in the college game. 
Nix already possesses a good feel for situations where he can make off-platform or cross-body throws. He knows himself. He doesn't get too invested in plays. He gets rid of the ball fast when he breaks the top pocket. He also throws the ball away on scheme plays rather than trying to force it into a receiver because that's where he's supposed to go and the play's foiled and he's basically short circuits and throws it into the coverage. This is something that a lot of young quarterbacks who are good prospects do too often. So, you know, listen, people believe experience and age leads to self-awareness. Now, it can be fact, a factor, but it's not the primary reason people become self-aware. They have to possess the skill and desire to do so. Listen, I had a grandfather who was married eight times. Eight times, okay? He had experience. He lived to an old enough age to know better, but he didn't have the self-awareness when it came to being able to understand himself and understand relationships not to avoid being married the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth time, okay? I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> I didn't have experience, but I had self-awareness of where I came from and my family tree. I've been married once, and I'm pretty damn sure that the only way I would ever be married again is if I became a widower, okay? Just saying, all right? And I'm very happy with Mrs. RSP, and I'm hopefully she's still happy with me after talking about this. So listen, Nick's, he reads the field better than credited. He accounts for the leverage of defenders with target decisions and placement. He's a willing tight window thrower. He knows how to protect his receivers. And he's made decisions and delivered targets with these skills at both Auburn and Oregon. And Auburn's receivers didn't do him a lot of favors from what I watched. And he possesses some small manipulative touches. This includes... Position in his frame after drops, after play fakes. His pump fakes punctuate his ability to hold defenders with his eyes. He's not the most exciting prospect on the board when you look at the superficial level of analysis that we generally see out in the media space um, with, you know, at least to fans, okay? But I think if he can translate the skills I mentioned, especially the self-awareness he's displayed to the NFL, I think it could outlast a lot more of the exciting names in this class. Okay, so now we're going to get to the rest of these quarterbacks. Austin Reed. He's a transfer from West Florida who led the team to the Division II National Championship in 2019. Man, this dude throws the ball like if there was a rampaging ele elephant in his path and that the ball was the only thing between him and that angry pachyderm not trampling him to death. Okay, he throws that ball like David's throwing a slingshot at Goliath, basically. You know, Reed's throwing motion and velocity aren't the only things with urgency about his playing style. He's an aggressive quarterback. He squeezes the ball in the windows that really don't appear open sometimes, but he gets the ball in the only place it can go. And as a result of that, he's also guilty of rushed off platform throws that are inaccurate and unnecessary. He has that kind of tight window, tight pocket flair and urgency of Stafford and Kurt Warner, but he's neither as mobile as Stafford nor as coverage savvy as Warner. In some respects, he has some of the good risk-taking flair of Tony Romo. Now, if Reed can ingrain recognition of coverage types pre-snap and post-snap, as well as what's advantageous and prohibitive in, for leverage between receivers and defenders, I think he has a chance to emerge from a practice squad or the back end of a roster, maybe even as a second contract starter, but I think he's likely a journeyman. I think he's a good quarterback prospect if you're not a fantasy guy. If you're just looking at the draft and hoping a team gets a little bit better on your quarterback bench, I think Reed has a chance to be that. And then maybe in three to four years, we might be talking about his fantasy value. Brennan Armstrong. He's a former Virginia quarterback who transferred to NC State last year. He got benched for part of the 2023 season as a development. Um, you know, and he's a developmental option. But for a league other than the NFL, if you ask me, he's a lefty. He's got an elongated throwing motion um, and a stance that should narrow to generate more acceptable velocity and accuracy. Um, he's going to have to narrow it for that to happen. His anticipation as a thrower is good in the short ranges of the field, but that's pretty much all. So first things first, he's got to unlock greater arm talent, and then he might be able to develop experience in another league 
and become a viable passer there. Okay, Caleb Williams. The questions I see most often or the topics I see most often are, is Caleb Williams the next Patrick Mahomes? Is he better than Patrick Mahomes? The answers are no and not right now. Now, I didn't say not yet, but not right now encompasses the possibility that Caleb Williams could be better than Patrick Mahomes someday. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he will be. Williams' style to me is more related to Aaron Rodgers than Patrick Mahomes. Now, that may seem like a subtle difference, but I like subtle differences. That can oftentimes lead to big differences in outcomes. Rodgers and Mahomes both threw incredibly well from unconventional platforms or throw incredibly well. It's not like they're done with their careers yet. But Mahomes' footwork, his base and situational application of these unconventional platforms, I think are rooted more in his experience as a shortstop and how he's been successful in applying them to football. Rodgers' movements are dynamic, but they're not borrowed from baseball and applied to football. So when you look at Williams, that's kind of the same thing if you watch close enough. Williams gets knocked around in some media scouting corners for his careless game management and decision-making, and there's some truth that that's happened for sure. And if you watch the Notre Dame game last year, that's for sure. And he's leaned too hard on his arm talent at times during his college career. And I think it's a natural occurrence with excellent throwers that I've seen when they're in, in the college game. I've seen it for the past 20 years. Um, Matthew Stafford certainly was that way. He comes to mind for me. What matters to me is whether Williams has shown he can learn from mistakes and apply those lessons during games as well as in supple- subsequent games. And he certainly showed that after the Notre Dame game and in other games too, and within other games. He illustrated, I think, this ability with blitzes, coverage types, and game management decisions. I think he's easily the best prospect in this class. And while it's possible if the Bears take him as expected, that they'll say, hey, see how we fucked up the Justin Fields development program? Well, son, hold my beer. Now, I don't think that's going to happen. I think that Williams is more conceptually advanced than Fields and should have an easier time, even if the Bears still take a bit of a ham-handed approach to their development. Um, But that said, let me just go, before we go to the next guy, let me say, I'd like Fields as my team's quarterback of the future, if not the present. Um, There may be other choices available that I'd prefer, depending on the team. But I think he has appeal. And if the Bears, for some reason, decide to trade the pick for Fields to get more um, draft capital to build their team and keep Fields, I would like that, even if I'm a little afraid that the Bears are going to fuck it up some more. Okay. Carter Bradley. South Alabama. His mechanics, his accuracy, and technical foundation, they need work. He's a transfer out of Toledo. He reacts to overreacts to edge pressure and interior pressure, and I think he begins maneuvering from pressure way too early. Like Brendan Armstrong, I think his best shot is a league other than the NFL to hone his craft, and maybe we can revisit where he's at in a few years. Devin Leary out of Kentucky, he's got the arm strength and fundamentals to earn an NFL roster spot. I think he surveys the field and finds secondary options routinely, and he targets tight coverage with good placement downfield. He just has difficulty making accurate reads with certain types of coverage, and and, um, specifically trail coverage from defenders. And I don't think he's adept at diagnosing different forms of pressure. His overall accuracy is also restricted to the short and intermediate ranges um, of the field in terms of like how consistent it is. His fundamentals and accuracy give him a shot at earning playing time, I think, in a professional league. But I don't think he's likely earning a long-term roster spot in the NFL right away, at least in, not until he's earned some stints to develop elsewhere where he gets playing time. All right, Drake May. I think a lot of you felt, you know, heard me talk about Drake May as a guy that I barely had a draftable grade for, if not one at all. Um And I still think, after I've watched him, that there are details with his game that could slow, if not derail, his development um, into becoming a competent NFL starter. There's gaps with identifying and acting on favorable leverage between his receivers and coverage. This is confidence. 
Processing is not just about identification. It's about the speed of confidence in which you act on it. It has to be ingrained. And I don't see that. He has difficulty spotting linebackers dropping from the line post-snap. He squeezes targets in the tight windows of man-to-man coverage where the defender has a clear advantage based on his position um, before he makes the throwing decision. And when forced outside the pocket, May loses perspective of the field. He'll try to muscle the ball between coverage with cross-body throws on the move that just are immature. Now, that's a common thing, but the... The spotting linebackers dropping, the squeezing targets in the windows and the man coverage where the leverage advantage is not there. Add all that up and, you know, that's a problem. And there's lapses where he's one to two beats late with delivering the ball to wide open receivers. And it happens because he's double checking other options. This happens most often with, you know, looks where receivers are flooding a zone. I've seen him repeatedly ignore receivers with with cushions as big as 7 to 10 yards from themselves and the nearest defender before the snap. Something where you look at and go, I can throw this ball here immediately. And instead of trusting what he saw pre-snap, May waits too long to throw and gives his opponents time to react. Now, on the rare occasions where May throws the ball away, and this is something he doesn't do enough at this point, It's often happening because he skipped a wide open out, or excuse me, a wide open read because he's been greedy about looking for something better. And when he finds that there's nothing there and that he didn't need to even look for a better read in in the down and distance situation where he was, by the time he looks to that original option that he had all along and saw, it's no longer open. And now he's got to throw the ball away. But it really took me it took me six games to see him throw a ball away. Six games of charting. It took the sixth game before I saw th- the first throw away. That's kind of nuts. Okay, so look, May has some good qualities to his game. He has some decision-making qualities that are good in terms of manipulating defenses during his initial drop. He works through progressions from sideline to sideline and can be timely with it. He shows some awareness of coverage that could peel off one option and cut off the potential target nearby. That's something that Michael Penix has had to work on and get better at and still has some um, gaffes with it from time to time. Um, Certainly J.J. McCarthy does too. May also recognizes some obvious leverage advantages and he can layer the ball in impressive fashion to reach the target. So there's some good here. If he can address the recurring issues mentioned, I think he becomes a competent to good decision maker and then pair that with the physical tools of a good starting quarterback and you've got a guy who I think has starter potential. I just don't think he's the number two quarterback in this draft and I don't think he is remotely the next safest quarterback in this class. To me, this underscores an important point too. Confidence is vital and a trackable trait with quarterbacking when you understand that confidence is a part of processing. Now, if I could pinpoint where a lot of teams miss with their evaluation of quarterbacks, it's this undervaluating of a a passer's confidence because it, it sounds like an intangible, but if you're defining the term with that ability to close the gap between identification to action, then you can see that. The whiteboard, the recall of plays and coverages, their identification. Teams annually praise top prospects for their identification in these settings, and and they believe it often translates to the field. Sometimes it does. Unfortunately, none of that identification is any good on the field if the confidence to act on the immediate point of recognition isn't there. So waiting for further confirmation of what's immediately seen rather than acting on what's immediately Scene is what plagues a lot of early round passers who teams annually praise for talking about the game like coaches in meetings before the draft. We heard that about Kenny Pickett. We heard it about Desmond Ritter. Now, May, he too often lacks his confidence to close the gap between identification to action. And there's not really, uh, but just put it this way, he does it, he doesn't close that gap well enough to project sustainable NFL success at this time. It doesn't mean he won't get there, but it's a common theme I've seen with top prospects who wash out. So he's kind of on that border of like, he could get there, but 
he also has a, a pretty good, um, pretty high potential to wash out if the situation isn't favorable for him. Emory Jones, okay, look. He has athletic ability and the throwing accuracy of an NFL prospect, but he has work ahead with his technical foundation as a thrower and reading coverage. If he can make strides with his baseline accuracy, develop a more advanced foundation with reading and manipulating coverage, Jones could offer promise a develop, as a developmental option for the NFL game. Gunnar Watson, look, he, he's also accurate with, uh, not also, Watson's accurate with boundary routes. He's good with back shoulder plays. He has a quick stroke with his release. And he's capable of some velocity and pinpoint accuracy there. But his lower body needs tightening to enhance the consistency with his accuracy. He has some difficulty reading leverage at various types. And it diminishes the effectiveness of his throwing talent. As a pure thrower, I think he has NFL ability. But he lacks the conceptual acumen. And I think he's going to struggle to earn an opportunity long term at the back end of a roster. Unless he gets playing experience elsewhere. Jack Plummer. Although he moves efficiently in the pocket when he identifies pressure, he lacks strong pocket pres awareness of edge pressure and closing off escape routes. He, uh, I think steady pressure throughout the game notably slows his processing speed, and underneath defenders dropping into passing lanes trip up Plummer at this point of his career. The technical opportunities are there to gain more velocity as a thrower, and if he can improve, improve his situational game management, there's potential for him to develop into an NFL reserve. Okay, Jaden Daniels. Okay, first though, let's tease you a little bit. The rookie scouting portfolio, pre-draft, post-draft publication is the goods. For $21.95, you get the most comprehensive look at skill positions at quarterback, running back, wide receiver, and tight end that's available to the general public. What you get for download on April 1 is a PDF that's fully bookmarked, and it contains information that my subscribers have learned is evergreen and even more valuable than the post-draft that's usually in high demand. The rankings cheat sheet you get, you also get um, rankings in pros formats um, with detailed profiles breaking down all the criteria I use to scout each position. You get a, the guide um, walks you through my defined and weighted criteria. So you gain an entertaining um, understanding of my evaluation process and how the pieces make the whole of each scouting report. The analysis with recent draft trends at each position and what I think is changing with how the league assesses these positions and a range of stylistic comparisons for each prospect. You get a minimum of 150 prospects. The rankings from my past three years of classes, classes are updated multiple times during the year. And with the post-draft guide that's part of the purchase, it's available or it's made available no later than seven days after the last day of the draft. This delivers great fantasy analysis rooted in football scouting. Um, that I did in the pre-draft publication. You get ADP, draft, um, ADP tracking from multiple leagues. You get updated rankings in a tiered cheat sheet with sweet spot values that show you basically where to pick the player um, based on what I'm looking at between my updated evaluation of the player's ranking and his post-draft ADP. You get fit analysis, depth chart analysis that incorporates which players have one or two years left on their deals and how I see their playing time sorted out relative to the incoming classes and the free agents who join the team. And you get a monthly newsletter with scouting reports and analysis and current and future prospects. www.mattwaldman.com Not only fantasy GMs love it, not only media gets it, but football people get it. According to Alex Brown, who's been a recruiting director at multiple schools and currently at SMU, it's got a great rep in the recruiting community in Division I football. He meets with these guys on a regular basis who evaluate NFL talent. And he tells me that the RSP was, is one of the two most purchased guides from independent evaluators to use as a cross-checking device. So there you have it. Jaden Daniels, back to him. I think the big debate point might be about his processing of coverage. When Daniels made multiple reads, I think he lacked time and impatience with too many routes based on the coverage, and he missed receivers coming open just as he turned away from the spot he was scanning. I think it's a case of comically tragic timing, and it's something that Dak Prescott often had at Mississippi State. Like Pres Prescott, Daniels, I think, is going to need a scheme with surrounding talent where he can have 
early success with quick decisions and gradually improve and develop confidence with progression reads. I don't think this is going to necessarily be easy to do without an experienced infrastructure of a veteran offense, like say what the Cowboys had for Prescott, or as or maybe without time to develop on the bench like Jordan Love, where he could run the scout team, prepare on his own, get some playing time at the end of games, maybe get some starts because a player gets injured but doesn't have to play for the rest of the season. If Daniels can earn the playing time to develop these skills or his new team gives him the training wheels that I think Lamar Jackson didn't need for quite as long as the Ravens leaned on it, I think Daniels has the basic tools and advanced physical skills to exploit his pocket management prowess to his fullest and his accuracy to his fullest and become a a competent NFL starter who may even be a very good fantasy option because of his running upside. J.J. McCarthy, man, let me tell you something. This dude was one of the more difficult evaluations at the quarterback position that I've performed in recent years. The reason is McCarthy's had excellent tools that give him the foundation to become a good NFL starter. But I think his development ultimately hinges on two things. One, how accurate is he really? And two, how well can he address his decision-making and processing gaffes? And he has a lot of them. If the high-end positives are an indicator that he'll address most of his flaws, the high-end expressions of his his leverage reading, the high-end expressions of his decision-making, and some of the placement that you see in highlights, I think he has the potential to become a franchise starter with Pro Bowl production potential. But if McCarthy proves accurate enough, but he can only make minor to moderate improvements with the decision-making, processing parts of his game, I think he's going to need a great infrastructure of surrounding talent and scheme fit to sustain, you know, mediocre starter production. And that may only translate to McCarthy becoming a high-end journeyman starter. Now, if McCarthy can overcome his flaws and he proves that he's not accurate, accurate beyond, say, the intermediate range of the field on a consistent basis... I think he has a shot to be Zach Wilson 2.0, and that's the version we've seen of Wilson thus far in his NFL career. Now, my projection isn't Wilson 2.0. Instead, it's a former starter with a Pro Bowl season under his belt, but not until he found his second home in the league. Even then, there were mistakes with this player that lingered. Now, McCarthy could be the good end of that player, and you'll know who that is when you get to the RSP in April. Let's go on to Joe Milton. Joe Milton III has all the physical and athletic tools to succeed in the NFL. His arm strength is among the best I've ever seen in terms of throwing with a combination of distance and velocity in the vertical game. Milton is also a capable runner. His legs and his size, they're viable weapons. Now, as salivating as his physical skills are, the conceptual side of the game needs work. His processing of coverage in dense areas of the field is too slow. And as a result, he gets impatient with his reads and he winds up missing slow developing routes that break open just after he abandons the structure of the play. Kind of Jaden Daniels-esque in that regard, but a little worse. He's at his best with scheme plays, I think, where there's one to two reads at most and then it's time to create off structure as a passer or runner. When reading multiple options from the pocket, Milton has a common problem that I think big quarterbacks with huge arms share. He's going to take unnecessary hits trying to be a hero and leans too hard on his size and arm strength rather than the potential quickness of efficient decisions. He's going to get a look in some camp because they're just not going to be able to pass up the physical skills and physical tools. But I wouldn't be surprised if he's playing in a different league to get experience and then maybe gets a second look in a few years. Jordan Travis, FSU. I like this kid if you put it in context of where I'm going. Travis, he's aggressive as a passer. He's a confident thrower in the tight windows. He trusts his receivers to make athletic plays. I think he's effective on the move. And the upside of his game is aggressive but accurate pass placement based on good reads of leverage that receivers have on defenders at the top of their stems. 
what I'm basically saying is he's going to throw some motherfuckers open, okay? And he does, and he's going to have the confidence to do it. Travis creates off structure. He can work in and outside the pocket. He's accurate in the intermediate and vertical game after efficiently moving away from pressure. And I think he manipulates defenders with a, with his eyes and body positions off drops. And he does it well to set up scheme plays and progression reads. If, if Travis just becomes wiser as a decision maker, he might just transcend reserve status in the NFL and become a playmaking journeyman starter a journeyman starter who could extend his tenure as the offensive leader if he develops a type of rapport with a primary receiver to like the one he had with Keon Coleman at FSU. Think Jeff Blake, if you remember Jeff Blake. There's some other players you could think of too um, in that regard, but he's kind of a mix of Jeff Blake, Case Keenum, and Jeff Garcia, um, if you could mash that up. you know, If he can develop to the best of their talents, we might have something. Keaton Slovis, once considered a top prospect who was at USC, he's a development player. He has the arm, pocket toughness, and athletic ability that's going to intrigue an NFL team. But man, he plays a lot slower than his time speed. And um, he's a lot better with vertical targets at the boundary than he is targeting the middle of the field. I think he has a difficulty with recognizing what's open and what's not at the earliest stages of the route. I think that's really troublesome with his game and projecting his development in the NFL. He also stares down targets past the point of patience, and it's a big tell to defensive backs who peel off assignments or cut off the passing lane. And he's tough as nails, and he's got to be because he really lacks a plan after avoiding a defender. And I don't think he really identifies the origin of pressure very well. The defenders are off in his face before he even sees it. I think there's a real lack of peripheral vision in this game. That's a little bit of a concern. I, I mean, like a real concern. It's almost like he's playing without a seatbelt. Michael Penix. Look, he's an efficient mover under pressure who can make a quick sidestep or climb. He resets his feet well. He finds the open man in the middle of the field better than I think um, people per, um, characterize. I think if Baker Mayfield or Kyler Murray did this better, I think both of them would be better than what their careers have purported them to be at this stage. Now, there's throws I'm concerned with from Penix that I don't think are going to work in the middle of the field that he's gotten away with at Washington. Um, but I, from what I've seen, the smart choices of his game are trending enough in the right direction that I'm projecting Penix is going to continue developing as a reader of the field. And really, it's more in the sense that he the the laps he's had have gotten less and less as the years have gone by. Um, he has a, you know, I would say at worst he's going to develop into a low end starter who can keep his team competitive if the surrounding talent and scheme are strong enough to maximize his strengths and minimize his flaws. At worst, Michael Pratt, he's a developmental prospect. He's got a high floor because he has good fundamentals. With his drop and his release footwork, he has a clean release motion, quality pump fakes and play fakes, decent size with his arm, strength. And I think NFL teams desire that from prospects. And there's potential to become a better pocket manager. He just waits too long. It's a common thread with his game in terms of waiting too long to throw the ball to targets in the middle of the field and outbreaking routes in all ranges of the field. He also waits too long to throw the ball away. He doesn't cut his losses after exhausting his viable options when pressure's imminent. He's got to wait until pressure's bearing down and he's making the throwaway attempt difficult, if not dangerous. There's times to avoid hits, and I think Pratt has, hasn't developed that maturity at this point. Sam Hartman, he, listen, man, he's aggressive. He has technically sound drops. He's got an excellent play-action game from center and pistol, and he has effective pump fakes. And despite his aggressive tendencies and solid technical foundation and and effective manipulation tendencies, the problem is he's got a limited arm. His vertical accuracy is really good, but it's limited to a range of 50 to 40 yards, or excuse me, 35 to 40 yards from the catch point, which can be just enough in a lot of schemes, but it's not necessarily a thing people are seeking from, from a starter. 
I love that he's willing to climb deep in the pockets to get the ball out. I just don't think there's significant room for an improvement with his arm velocity. Um, and really the only thing he can do to tighten up his release footwork is to really just keep it from keep his targets from sailing unnecessarily. I think at best he's a distributor in an offense where he gets the ball out quickly and the vertical game is set up for him to attack immediately when the matchup is favorable. But the problem is, is that the longer Hartman's got to wait to deliver the ball, the more diminishing returns occur with his game because he lacks that velocity to get out of trouble or force targets that aren't theoretically advisable without top arm strength. Spencer Radler, as we go down the stretch here, Spencer Radler is much better at identifying open options. Well, let's start. Let's start from the beginning. His baseline is similar to Baker Mayfield in some regards, but his strengths and weaknesses against coverage are a little more opposite. Mayfield entered the league having more difficulty with tight man-to-man coverage, especially when there was pressure forcing him to climb the pocket and make leverage reads and throws. Rattler has difficulty reading the position of defenders in zone coverage when his offense isn't scheming a play with only one place to throw the ball. Rattler's much better identifying open options based on defender position when he's facing man-to-man coverage, and his greatest success against zone coverage occurs when his team just leverages mobility and accuracy with clear, quick reads as a distributor point guard. I think there's potential for him um, to become a good backup and maybe a journeyman starter. Um, Teams are intrigued with him right now. Um, But that zone thing, I want to see how fast he can get better at it. Tanner Mordecai, last one. Mordecai's got a good arm. It's not great, but it's good enough. His release process, it could use a little more work if he wants to unlock the full potential of talent that he has untapped as a thrower. But I'm not sure that that effort's going to yield enough in return for it to be the highest priority with his development. I love that he trusts his receivers. If you watch him at SMU, you could see that he really trusted Rishi Rice. Anybody that's got a contested catch skill, he's going to throw them open in tight zone windows. Um, and so I really love that about him. He's got an aggressive mentality. Now, at West Con- Wisconsin, he kind of lacked the comfort level with his surrounding talent and didn't have quite the receiver talent. So he was a little slower with his reads and he was a little one to two beat maybe one to two beats slower with processing um lack of rapport was an issue but also mordecai can be a little slower to read the middle of the field when the coverage looks have a little bit more complexity so that's it i'm going to be doing a wide receiver solo pod sometime in the next eight to ten days probably going to take the night off tonight we'll see i might watch some wide receivers you know i can't stay away but in the meantime Get your RSP, mattwaldman.com. Thanks again for listening. I'll be back with Bob Harris on Monday. Uh, some down, somewhere down the line, me and Brandon Angelo will do another podcast during the month probably, as well as Adam Harstead. Thanks again for listening. I really appreciate you. Appreciate your support in the RSP. It means a lot to me. This thing came from nowhere, um, and I was going nowhere in my life, to be honest with you probably from where I thought I needed to go when I got started doing this. And, you know, when you buy this, you you do a great job of uh, helping me feel like, uh, you know, I made the right call. And I try to do the work that I can to make sure that you feel like I made the right call. Thanks, Kim. Have a good week.